Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here and to carry on with our study in Daniel. This is the most profound prophetic word in the entire Bible. In my mind, it unequivocally proves, A, that the Bible got written outside of our time domain by God, and B, that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, because he's the absolutely only one that could possibly fulfill the prophetic word to the day and the hour. And it's going to be very fascinating. I'm excited to show you what Robert Anderson and in the late 1800s discovered in the word of God. He was head of Scotland Yard and um, a, a detective with a detective mind. And he, he sleuthed out the precise date. And it's very, very fascinating to see. It will blow your mind. And uh, most theologians, uh, most conservative theologians, well, not liberal ones, but some wonder if Daniel even wrote Daniel. But Jesus said Daniel wrote Daniel and that he was a prophet. So if you were believe Jesus, you accept that and you carry on. If if you don't believe Jesus, you've got bigger problems than that. So, all right. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of it, the incredible, miraculous nature of it. Everywhere we look, we just thank you, Lord, for Daniel's life and uh, your visitation by, by Gabriel, Lord. We just pray, Lord, as we look at your word today, that it would resonate with us, that it would speak to our hearts and minds, and that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Karen, come give us a quick debriefing. I'll pull this up, sharing. So, um, I'm sure, green. Chapter 9b, the second half, the interrupted dream. Right. We're going to just start with a quick review. Good morning, everyone. Hello to the reads. Okay, so uh, remember last week we were looking at the first half of chapter 9, actually the biggest half, 1 to 19. Today we're only doing seven verses, seven powerful verses. So um, this was Daniel's prayer. Um of uh of repentance for the city or for the for the people and uh, i looked at it uh, into four parts so preparation for prayer adoration confession and then his appeal for forgiveness and so we looked at daniel remember he was in prayer he was in the word he was reading jeremiah's prophecy in jeremiah 29 verse 1 it says jeremiah 2 i can't remember but to anyway to all the people that are in captivity in basically, basically in exile yeah so uh, he wrote this to them, sent this letter to them, and Daniel's reading it. And it says, all that it says is, it's going to be 70 years of captivity, 70 years. And so um, he turned to God in prayer, serious prayer. He was obviously contrite and broken over Israel's sin. And uh, then he went into the adoration. First thing he did was confess God's greatness, his faithfulness and loving kindness. And then we noted that the uh, adoration continues through his confession and through right through to his appeal for forgiveness, that that adoration for Christ, for for Christ continues all the way through. And so then he starts his confession with "We've sinned." Most important part: "We've sinned," um, and then describes the details of that. He says, "We've been wicked. We've rebelled. We've been disobedient." And then he also confesses that the calamity that they're experiencing um, was God's promised judgment for their disobedience. And then he comes to the, his appeal for forgiveness. And that basically, again, he's saying, oh, Lord, who's been faithful to us, we've sinned. So you can see him here still adoring God and praising him. And then according to thy righteousness, turn away wrath. And he's contrasting God's faithfulness with their unfaithfulness. And uh, finally, he uh, says that he knows that that appeal um, or he's saying his appeal is on the basis of his compassion and not their merit. And he ends with hear, forgive and act. Why? For thy sake because we bear your name. And so a faithful prayer is full of confession, but lots more to confession than to sin. We confess his righteousness. We confess our own faith and his faithfulness to act and forgive. And he's also confessing that it's about God's goodness, not our merit. Focus verse was 11 and 18. I put them together to get the full gist of the chapter. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed thy law and turned aside, not obeying thy voice. So the curse has been poured out on us, along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, 
the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Oh, my God. And clear the, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we are not presenting our supplications before thee on account of any merit of our own, but on account of thy great compassion. And the truth um, I found here is authentic, repentant prayer includes humble confession of sin, God's righteousness, and his faithfulness to forgive. And the application, how do your prayers reflect uh, of repentance reflect your knowledge of God's righteousness and forgiveness? And the two applicable themes were, one, God is sovereign over all, and four, prayer is an essential practice for perseverance and faithfulness to God. And then to look at today, this is an amazing section of scripture, verses 20 to 27, mostly 24 to 27 is, is the prophecy. And it's famously known as the 70 weeks prophecy. So while he's confessing and praying and appealing to God, Gabriel comes to him and interrupts his prayer. And note that, that God comes to us when we are um, in contrition before God, seriously praying and God will come and enlighten us through the word, just through his spirit. And so um, Gabriel came to, da to Daniel to give him understanding and skill to understand the vision. Now, which vision is he talking about? Because he'd already interpreted that vision in chapter eight. But um, uh, Daniel had given him in chapter eight, at the very beginning, he had said, Gabriel had said, after 2300 days, the holy place will be restored. So now he's going to give him the detail about that. So he did interpret the vision, but now he's going to give him some interpretation on the timeline um, of that uh, 70, 70 weeks, 70 years, and then 70 weeks. So um, verses 24 to 27, the most significant, inf infamous prophecy of the Old Testament, which basically describes to the day Christ's entry into Jerusalem. So Daniel had already read about 70 years, right, in, in his prayer. And now Gabriel is going to expound on that for him. So the universal, there's basically universal agreement between scholars and commentaries that the 70 years equals 70 sets of 70 years or weeks of years. So 70 times seven, which is 490. So in ancient Hebrew, a week refers to a unit of seven. So seven days or seven years. So What's to happen in this 70 weeks? Well, in verse 24, it tells us, finish the transgression, make an end of sin, reconciliation for iniquity, bring eternal righteousness, seal up the vision, and anoint the most holy place. And in order for those things to be fulfilled completely, there has to be a new righteous order uh, on earth. There has to be iniquity, has to be reconciled with God's holiness. And obviously, the Messiah is reigning at this time. So it's the end. Also, it's the end of the earthly kingdoms. So Christ's kingdom becomes the mountain that the whole chapter two is all about. Right. So at the end of this 70 weeks um, of 70 years is uh, Christ's kingdom becomes that mountain forever. It's, uh, it's um, we're, we're in that the end times there when he takes over. So um, verses 25 to 27, uh, seven, Gabriel breaks down that timeline for those six accomplish, uh, accomplishments. Um, with the plain, literal meaning of the words here. So 70 weeks of years or 77s, 490 years from the starting point, which is Artaxerxes Longamanus' decree in 445 for Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the walls and build, rebuild Jerusalem to the end of days when sin and Satan are, have been put away forever. And so most all scholars believe that it's 69 weeks of years using the 360 day year, which they used back in the, that day, and is always used in prophecy, um, from the decree in 445 to Christ's entry. And I mean, yeah. And then there's a long pause, and then you get the final week, which is the tribulation. And with that event at the middle at three and a half years. So the 70 weeks is divided into three parts, seven weeks, which is 49 years from the decree until uh, Nehemiah has built, built the uh, city and the walls. And then a full 69 weeks, including that seven weeks, brings you, which is 483 years from the decree of, uh, from that decree until Messiah appears in the triumphal entry. And the 70th week is that uh, prophecy, the seventh year tribulation of, at the end of time. So that's in our future still. So that's how Christ's coming 
is prophesied to the day. And then, of course, we know how many days to the crucifixion. Um, so I'm not going to go into the detail about that. I'm going to leave that for you. So focus verse is six, uh, sorry, 924. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, make atonement for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So the decree, or the suit, sorry, the truth, very simple, six words. God's prophetic decrees will be fulfilled. And the application, how does the way you live your life witness to your confidence in, in scripture's prophecy about Christ coming. This is what I'm talking about there. So on the applica applicable Daniel themes are one, two, and four, uh, but there's also an argument for three because Daniel is obviously still being honored after not assimilating into the culture. He is in serious prayer with God. He is being met and uh, they are blessing him. So he's still being honored. And that's all I have to say. Let's go. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Very, very good. All right, what we're going to try to accomplish today is a recap of where we are in the timeline of Daniel's life. You know, I had also intended to briefly touch on this again, and Tim, I thank you so much for getting our Bible verse right. I've corrected that uh, in our in our previous study. We're going to re have a reading of chapter 9, because Karen is convinced we, we must read it in continuity. It doesn't help just to outline when we're on it. Understand the length of the biblical prophetic year. Um, why is it 360 days? And I believe the year was once 360 days. I probably spent a little too much time on it. We'll see what happens. And then expository study of nine, the second half. And then the most definitive and amazing prophetic word of all time, proving that Christ is the Messiah, the King. So a recap of Daniel's life. And uh, this is, in fact, the, uh, the books. And you've seen this many times. And where are we? And again, we are on chapter um, 9, which is the vision of 70 weeks. That's in 538 BC. The Bible tells us that. And it tells us uh, that it's the first year of Darius' reign, which you remember um, Belshazzar dies after he sees the handwriting on the wall. He's uh, found Mena Mena Teko Parson, right? He's found Wade, found Wanting, and the Medes and the Persians are going to take over. He dies that night, and in the next day is the start of Darius's reign. So that's the first year, 538 BC. They did incredible, um, you know, all of the um, secular historians have the dates all the same. So they're very, very accurate. Uh, it's known history. So um, here it is in Daniel chapter 9, 1, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent. So he's the Medes of the Medes and the Persians, because we know Cyrus also came, he's the Persian component, Medes and Persians, and they take over, uh, ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. They're in Babylon, and the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scripture. So he's reading his Bible, which is really interesting, because we tend to think of our Bible as having been written very, very long ago. Jeremiah was alive in the start, and you can see it on your chart, right? Um, uh, he gets slept to uh, to Egypt in, in 593. Plus or minus, uh, sorry, 585. Um, that's the forced flight to Egypt. Um, and so you can see Jeremiah's life. So as a kid, like he would have been cognizant of Jeremiah's writing already as a young man, right? In his early uh, 20s, late teens. And so that's kind of interesting. Um, returned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord. And then we have this incredible prayer a very intense prayer, which gets interrupted by Gabriel. Gabriel appears um, twice here, and he will appear again two times 500 years from now, right? Uh, who does he appear to? He appears to, who does Gabriel appear to? He's, he's standing in the Holy of Holies next to the incense altar when Zachariah is there uh, doing his turn. He says, you're going to have a son. What? My wife is past menopause. This can't be. Oh, you doubted. Now you're not allowed to talk until that baby's born and you affirm his name to be John. Mm -hmm. So he writes it on a thing. And the minute he writes it on a little plaque and says his name will be John, suddenly can speak again. Amazing miracle, right? And then yeah. to Mary, okay. Gabriel, of yeah. course, we know absolutely unequivocally okay. yeah. uh, that that happened. And so wonderful. Okay. So um, now we're in chapter nine. Well, that was nine verse one. So oh, here is, uh, I always love finding the archaeology. So 
much, much more prevalent in Iran and Iraq, of course, giving us not a lot of access to it. But that's where the uh, Cyrus Cylinder gets found is under the foundations of Babylon. This beautiful mural here gets found, and there he is sitting on his throne, gets a little footstool, looks like a glorified chair. A little bit of doweling going on. They had uh, um, lathes in those days. Isn't that interesting, eh? All right. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the king of the age of 62. We get an aged king of Darius taken over, and it is in that first year of his reign that we are. There we go. And this is the chart I've built for you. So you remember how it was with the three sieges. Well, here's the three sieges, right? So the first one takes out Jehoiakim as the vassal because he's uh, actually places Jehoiakim as a vassal. Then we get Jehoiakim, and he's not doing what he's supposed to do. And then we get his uncle, Zedekiah. He doesn't even show up in the royal line. So this ends the royalty. I've got another chart I built. Karen was asking me about the 360 days. Al, when, when, what was it? A 360 day calendar at the time? Well, it was in a quandary at the time, and I'll show you how that all fits together. But um, we discover this ends the kingdom. There is no throne of David and never has been since the year uh, of the last, uh, the, the last 587 BC, the last exile. On that day, the day that they went to Babylon, on that day, the royal throne ended. The royal throne of David ended that day. There is none. There has been none for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? And it's also a very short kingdom on the other end. I'll be interested to show you that. So here it is on that other chart. Israel goes into exile to Assyria early, and that was a siege that took Daniel. We have three of them over here, all right? There's, there's three sieges. We'll zoom in on that. Siege one under Jehoiakim. Jehoiachin, and then Zedekiah at the very end. Zedekiah's eyes get poked out, right? Very interesting. Okay. So those those three are here, going up rather than down. Um, just, just a different way of looking at it. I figured north, right? There we go. I was thinking to pop it over a map one day. There's Jeremiah's life. So he's observing and actually writing against these kings, and he keeps telling them, guys, if you don't smarten up, we're going to lose the temple. We're going to lose the city. Would you listen already? God has told us we're supposed to be subject to Babylon. We're supposed to go there. We're supposed to have families. We're supposed to prosper. And as we prosper and, and the nation prospers, so shall we prosper. Will you, why do you not listen to this? But they keep rebellion. And rebellion and Zedekiah rebels to the point that, yeah, that temple gets torn down, burnt, burnt to the ground, right? Oh, my goodness. It had cedar inside. It was a very good earthquake design. All of that mass of rock uh, becomes very prone to falling apart. Karen and I had the wonderful uh, experience of being in Ephesus, but there's been earthquake after earthquake. When you build things out of rocks, they don't hold together really well. And that earthquake shakes it and all the little rocks come tumbling down. It had a lining of major cedar beams that would give it that support. It was um, the most, the biggest, longest standing Christian building is the Haggai Sophia in Constantinople in Istanbul, and uh, it is it is the, the it, for thousands of years it was the largest space ever built, right? Um, by just Justinius, and it is the the first Christian major Christian church. And when Justinius built it, he says, "Solomon, I've outdone you." It's a glorious structure. I, I think it's on the bucket list. If we ever can go there, we got to get there. Okay, now we're a recap. Uh, now we're into reading. So the interrupted prayer. Does somebody want to read today? It's not too long. Anybody that can see clearly and speak loudly? Seventy weeks are determined for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. Sorry, starting at verse 20. Yeah, no, it's all good. My fault. 20, yeah, just a, yep, not, not all that long. Now while I was speaking... Praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people and presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked to me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, 
the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Twenty, pardon me, seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Note, therefore, and understand that from going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings, the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Thank you so much, Bruce. I would have interrupted myself 17 times in that. Okay. <laughs> it's wonderful. All right. So um, we have to understand um, the 360-day year. And I hope to leave you with evidence in just a few minutes here. i got to keep track of the time, make sure I don't run out on the other end in the expository. Now well, we got time. Good. This is Sir Robert Anderson. He was knighted. He was made a knight. Um, he was uh, head of Scotland Yard. And he was also, uh, being an intelligence officer, he also was a theologian and a writer. So you can see his mind is set on sleuthing out truth. And he he reached out all over the place. Oh, my goodness. You read his stories, uh, who all he went to, to make sure he got the days exactly right. Right. And, of course, science was just emerging where they were really tracking with uh, days and everything like that. But he writes a book called The Coming Prince in 1894. Right. So that is... Uh, uh, six years before he passes, uh, adding the time of God's dealing with Israel during a 490-year period. The period began with the issuing of a decree in 445 B.C. by Artaxerxes Longermanus. Longermanus means long hand. He had one long hand. And in the ancient things where they uh, diagram him, they show him with his long hand. Longermanus means one hand. He had one long flipper, just the way God created him. Uh, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, that we see in Nehemiah 2, 5. The period will end with the return of Jesus. After 483 years, there'll be an interruption that will last over 2,000 years, plus a seven-year period known as the Tribulation, or the seventh week of Daniel. Now remember, um, the reason Gabriel came was to show Daniel the end times. I want to show you and tell you about that. But in the meantime, all this other stuff is going to happen, and there will be this big pause or this big interlude. So this is the way that it rolls out graphically. And not my graph. This is his graph. Um, so from the rebuilding of the temple, then the 62 weeks, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, it is that triumphal day of coming into Jerusalem that was pegged by Gabriel at that time. But then immediately after, he is cut off. He is killed, but not for himself, but for who? For all of our sins, right? The word is karat. It means cut off or murdered or killed, right? Um, and it's uh, um, Yeshua. It's actually a Mashiach. Nagid, uh, the word Nagid is the king, uh, gets used for the first time in the Hebrew for uh, King Saul when he gets made king, if you're looking at the Hebrew. So there we go. The critical premise that people could not pin together was that God uses a 360 year day, 60 day year. All right, nature's calendar used to be perfect. Um, so we had exactly 360 days. The Hebrew calendar to this day is um, because of what we, we read about. They, they try to work with uh, um, a uh, 12 months of 30 days. That's how they try to work it. And, of course, they've got problems because that's just not how. And this is the chart that I made. So at the top, just so that I could get the spacing proportionate, this is proportionate spacing. Um, I put that big, long book that I sh I've laid out here on the floor. 
which is the map of world history all the way to uh, the year 2000. This one goes to Mulroney's, the last prime minister for Canada down here is a little thin stretch. But um, so we get the creation of the world at the start. Very interesting that the book shows it that way. That's wonderful. Uh, they make some allusions to evolution stuff before that, but that's all, you know, uh, I happen to take the Bible literally. Then we have Noah's flood shows up as the deluge here as a line. So it's interesting. When you go through uh, the Noah's flood story, which I will not do with you today, you discover it's a 360-day year because of the way that it breaks out all of the months and when what happened, but it gives it all by month and day over and over again. So you actually can go through that and discover so then we have the Tower of Babel that occurs here, and we actually have an international 360-day calendar constancy. I did not give us all of the names of all the calendars that show up as 300, but every culture on Earth showed a 360-day calendar, and they were insanely intense about counting days because that's what they did. They looked at the stars and they counted the days of a year, and they counted, and they counted, and they counted. And if every culture did it that way, that's that's fascinating, right? All right. Then we get some interesting events such as the exodus from Egypt, and we suddenly have these incredible hailstones. So if you read, um, help me out, honey, uh, Worlds in Collision by Velikovsky, uh, the book that was on Einstein's reading table when he died. So when I, so they, you know, they've tracked with what Einstein was going on in his head. He was reading Velikovsky's book. And uh, he claims that, that, that Mars would get close to the Earth, and it was on a resonant frequency and translated some of its orbital energy to the Earth and caused the Earth to shift. And, and that's why we end up with some very interesting events that occurred. And he explained through his book, of course, secular science doesn't like him at all. They totally diss him. This can't be true. What is all this stuff? It, it's way too biblical for us. Um, and so they they throw it all out. I, I kind of like the book. To me, it makes a lot of sense. And like Einstein, I'm tempted to read it on my deathbed as well. Um, so we get something called Joshua's Long Day. We'll look at that briefly. But for 22 hours, the sun stands still. Every culture on Earth records an event like that. That's, that's crazy. Then we have King David um, ascends to the throne. So we get a little brief period of King Saul. But look how short in the history of mankind and how near the middle. Israel and Judah, the throne of David is only there. It's that brief little period in time. Then we have Israel exiled to Assyria. hundred years later, we have um, Judah exiled to Babylon, right? And there's a very interesting thing that happens with Hezekiah right here. Um, Hezekiah is about to die, so he calls in Isaiah, and he says, Isaiah, I'm about to die. He says, you know what, um, I'll look after you. If you're repentant, I'll make this poultice of figs, and I'll put it on you, and you'll be healed. And he says, how will I know? He says, well, you want a sign? What, do, what kind of a sign do you want? Do you want the sun to go forward, or do you want the sun to go backward? Well, it's easy to make it go forward. Just make it go backward. And so on Ahab's stairs, he makes the sun go back. Guys, that is profound interruption of of, of the world as we know it, Right? It gets interesting. Then, then we have uh, Julius Caesar gets to the point where he's recognizing, you know what, harvest is really drifting off of normal. i got to make a new calendar. So that is 46 years before Christ is born. He's got to adjust it, and he makes a Julian calendar. And it sticks. It sticks a long time. It still is considered in today's international timeline. Interesting. All right. But then uh, Pope Gregory realizes still a mess with it we're still out and and oh my goodness it's a problem and so then we get the gregorian calendar and most of your calendars if you open it today that's the gregorian calendar right and then we get universal constant time and then we get international atomic time it's france tends to take a lead and so the initials for it seem backward but um did you guys know that there's leap seconds that's what we're trying to figure out now is the leap seconds. We'll get into it. Okay, I'll try to hurry here. All right, 360. Uh, so Rome, India, Mesoamerica, Egypt all had 360-day uh, calendars. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, ancient Egyptian story of how five days got added. So they realized there's a problem. I'm not going to read all this, but I'll try to get it to you as a PDF. And um, they have to add five days. So I was looking like crazy, and I think I might have a photograph of an Egyptian calendar on the ceiling in one of the pyramid rooms. But you can see here, there's there's uh, 12 months, 30 days. And um, this is the tomb of Senenmut and, um, in Thebes. And, and, and they have a calendar. And they're counting so 
explicitly accurately because that they they had time. The crops would grow and there was enough people to feed them. Not like the Eskimos who had to hunt all day long, right? They didn't even have a word for art, but they had 50 words for snow. Uh, very interesting. These guys had time on their hands and they were going to count the stars and the circulation. They're going to know when 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 it's all back in alignment again. They would count the years. So they got it really, really straight, right? And so uh, we have a legend that, and they're ridiculous legends, uh, how the five days get, get added. I'm not even going to read it because it's just silliness, right? Um, Thoth uh, takes the extra time and gives it to Nut. Uh, Earth's number of days per year, allowing Nut to give birth to a succession of children. One upon each of the extra five days were added to the original 360. And the moon losing its light had effect on it became so it really just is really accommodating for these five extra days. So what about Mesoamerica? So the Mayans, they're crazy about the calendar. Have you seen a Mayan calendar? They go into it. Oh, my goodness, right? We had that big thing uh, when we flipped to the year 2000 because their calendar kind of ends at that time. But they have to add five days. And they call them unlucky and dangerous, called Wayab. And during this time, people just stayed home, like on, under COVID, and neglected all activities, uh, this time to avoid disaster. So they would just stay home and hide, right? Okay. Guys, am I convincing you yet? Okay. The ancient Babylonian calendar was a 360-day year, uh, 12 months of exactly 30 each. It's exactly like the Hebrew. And it's based on 660. So if you want a remnant... We have each month, beginning when the new crescent moon was observed, the month consists of 30 days. Months divided into two weeks. Each week had seven days. Each day had seven, 24 hours. The long thing about seven days. I could speak an hour on that. Each hour consists of 60 minutes, 60 seconds, and uh, your clock still run on 60 seconds per minute. And the whole earth gets divided. I, I work with this every day. Uh, I, every day I work out, there, I get the question, what's the northings and eastings for that site? And we work out the corners of the property based on the northings and the easting, based on 360 degrees of the earth and the circumference. All of that comes out of the Babylonian Empire. And here's a little uh, chart that shows their calculations and how they came up with uh, 360 degrees in a circle and why the sphere is and the whole earth is broken into 360 degrees. And this is true for today. And when I talk to my surveyors, we speak the same language and we talk about this, this sexagesimal system of 60. And it's based on this whole idea of the earth turning over 360 days in a year. Guys, very, very convincing. Like, it's really hard to argue with, right? Um, and uh, why we have, uh, which is interesting as well. It's the only number that can be divided into sections of 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 15, 12, 10, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Uh, smallest number divisible by every number, one to six, lowest common multiple of one, two, three, four, five, and six. Very, very logical, very profound, and very strong. So that gets um, done here. But by the time that uh, uh, it, it's a problem, we already have this interruption. Here we have um, the 12 months of 30 days that make up the, the Hebrew calendar. And there's an interesting thing that happens after Passover. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So in Exodus 12, verse 1 and 2, there's something gone on in the heavenlies because God redefines it. He says, I'm going to give you a new month of Nisan because it's obviously been changed. And now you need a new one. And here it is. All right. Okay. Now we have Joshua's long day. Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel said in the sight of, the, of Israel. So he's saying it in front of everybody. Everybody can listen in. Hey, guys. Sun stands still over Gibeah. The moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? Oh, we got to find that book of Jasher. I'm sure it'll appear sometime. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down about a whole day. 22 hours, we believe, and there's been no day like that before it or after it that the Lord heeded to the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. He had the sun to stand still for day. Boy, that creates a lot of problems for scientists and has a lot of Christians in dilemma, because how can that even be? Wouldn't all the water slosh all over the land, and wouldn't it be a mess? Well, I don't know how God did it, but he did it, and the land from where he saw it becomes his inheritance. That part of the world gets given He's the only one. He and Gideon both get a little piece of Israel assigned to them apart from the 12 tribes. And he gets the little spot where he saw that go on. That becomes his place. OK, now this is a map of uh, from the exact same time period of stories about a long day. 
So if you've ever been to Hawaii, you discover that Maui, the demigod, lassoes the sun and holds it on the horizon for 22 hours because he's got to convince uh, the sun god that he's got to go slower in the sky and make it longer days so that his mother can dry the tapa. Like that's how their story goes, right? But it means that something happened there. And lo and behold, if that isn't at a spot where if you're going to hold the sun for 22 hours, that's exactly what would happen, right? So go to Hawaii. It's a wonderful little trip. Go and hear the story about Maui. Find it and you will discover, oh my goodness, the sun hovered on the horizon for 22 hours. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The Popo Blue in Guatemala, they, they wring their hands. It does not sound like, you know, a traditional fictitious story. It says... They're wringing their hands. Will the sun ever rise again? They're knowing something's going on and their guts are wrenching. And you read it and you know that this is not a myth. You know that this is an experience that people are having. It's in the Popol Vu, which is a book of Guatemala. I had Carlos, uh, who comes from Guatemala, bring me a book back so I could read it firsthand right out of the book. It's a long night of 22 hours. Well, that makes sense. Look, at this is nighttime, the blue, right? And then, oh my goodness, here is Israel. And, and we get the story of Joshua's long day. But lo and behold, if China doesn't have a long day, what's with that? Well, of course, China would have a long day, and they record it because they're very good at recording the stuff. And and you have a Chinese king, uh, Wang, who who records the long day. Okay, sound like history to you? This is all of what Velikovsky uses to write his book and to make his claim, right? Very, very fascinating. So something gets messed with time. And so all of that is to say that when... God, um, oh, one more thing. Hezekiah says to Isaiah, what is the sign the Lord will heal me and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day? He gets 15 years added to his life, Hezekiah. Um, and Isaiah said, this is a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Do you want the shadow to go forward 10 degrees or do you want to go backwards 10 degrees? What do you, what do you want? And Hezekiah answered, it's an easy thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. No, uh, let the shadow go back backward 10 degrees so what what's that all about this is in 712 bc um so um so isaiah the prophet cried out to the lord he brought the shadow 10 degrees backward by which had gone down on the sundial of ahaz ahaz was an earlier king we know how that looked this is a sundial and they would track with the sun shadow here off this wall coming up the stairs and when he prayed he made it go backwards okay we know that the sun and the relationship of the orbits and the rotation of the earth is being messed with no doubt eh? Okay, good. That happened there. Now then we get the Julian calendar, the Gregorian calendar. This is all taking a little too long, so I'm going to go a little faster. Um, he makes it 365, still not exactly right. Then we get a leap year, and we get the rules of the leap year. And then we get the Gregorian calendar, because Pope Gregory says, i got to get it closer, because we still got a mess. And then, and then um, that's interesting. All of the Catholic countries absorb it, and they do it right when Pope Gregory says it. It doesn't arrive to the non-Catholic countries until the 17th century. And in 1752, the British Empire, which was probably the largest colonization force on Earth, except, and by 1752, we have the Gregorian calendar, which is very late in history, isn't it? That's, that's, that's really late till we suddenly discover exactly the length of the year. And they're pretty darn good back in the 1700s. Got telescopes and stuff going on. And that's, that's, then, now, another interesting thing is the year of our Lord, uh, Anno Domini. Um, it was established in 525. So Christ had already died for, and it was 500 years in, when they established it. And uh, they've got a mess because Easter tends to drift. And so uh, all the more reason that they have to, number one, establish uh, uh, something to measure around. And, you know, every time somebody writes the date, you acknowledge Jesus Christ doesn't matter how you define it and how you slice it. When you research the history, you realize, oh, my goodness, I'm writing about in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every time you write a date, you acknowledge Jesus Christ. Isn't God amazing how he made that all come together? Fascinating to me. All right. Now we've got UTC and TAI. It's the International Atomic Time. Um, there are 80 national laboratories worldwide with 450 atomic clock, and they're all measuring to determine... Um, uh, a continuous scale of time without leap seconds, but we have leap seconds. So in the year 1972, we discover we're out by 10 leap seconds. And so then we have another 27 since 1972. And so we're determining to the second, the rotation of the earth. It's going to get messed up again, guys. I know it for sure. Um, so um, 
1958, and interestingly, this is the British atomic clock. Mom, it's considered the best in the world. There we go. It's the British one. And um, EAI and UTI has been drifting apart with uh, uh, TAI being the more accurate. And it's got now this 27 leap seconds. So we're we're almost a half minute out from one time to the other. Half minute. Oh, my goodness. In, in a year. <laughs> we're getting close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so um, the reason that we're getting these little leap seconds is because um, because the rotation of the Earth is slowly winding down. Very, very tiny amounts, but it's starting to slow because it got spun once. Have you ever spun one of those kids' little spinning tops? They spin for a really long time, but eventually they erode. Guys, evolution, the Big Bang, guys, like it doesn't build itself. It degrades. It's called entropy. Things get worse. There's no such thing as the, the theory of evolution. It is absolute garbage nonsense. Don't believe that stuff, but you can't get into university without it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. All right. Now, we understand it's 360 days. So while I was uh, confessing my sin, so Let's take a literal look at, at the word of Daniel. And when we get to the 360 days and um, um, Robert Anderson's summation, I'm hoping it'll be clear to us based on what we've just talked about. But so he was confessing a sin and the sin of his people. We're trying to figure out his sin. He's the only person next to Joseph in the Old Testament that nothing bad is said about. And of course, Jesus Christ. And while he's in prayer, Gabriel comes in swift flight at the time of evening sacrifice. I mentioned this last week uh, in the King James, it says the evening oblation, but there was none. The temple was gone. There was no sacrifice. And this whole concept of the sacrifice has been quite a dilemma for the Jews. They have had to change their religion, right? They are now no longer in that wavelength, right? Of uh, but But they're hoping for it. They're believing for it to be reinstated, and they used to believe that uh, that that the uh, that the Messiah was God, right? You remember when he get uh, the Son of God? You remember when he gets questioned by Caiaphas just before his death, right? He says, uh, "Are are are you the Son of God?" And he says, "You say that I am." Today, the Messianic Jews no longer believe that he's the Son of God but that he's a man and he's going to come and he's going to help them build the temple. So they are, mm -hmm. no, sorry, not the Messianic Jews, the Jews. Thank you, honey. Very, very much appreciate that. The the Jews, the ones that have the temple Institute that are trying to, uh, you know, serve God that way, they actually want desperately and they're going to, they're so ripe to follow an antichrist who gives them a temple back. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's enough room um, because the, um, the Holy of Holies is over um, the, the, uh, dome of the spirit which is also called the dome of the book and uh that is they won't let you step into there oh my goodness um, i've spoken to a few people who have tried they are on it they'll they'll keep you off of it but that was actually over the holy of holies and there's enough room it's right in alignment with the eastern gate if you look at it in google earth you can discover there's enough room to build the temple according to solomon's geometry and you'll remember it says uh when they go to measure it uh don't measure that that's given over to the gentiles well there's going to be part of the holy hill that is for the Gentiles. I believe that's going to be the Dome of the Rock still standing, which actually was um, a Roman um, chapel that got built by the Romans, then got taken over by the Muslims and is the Dome of the Rock. But they inscribed it with tiles on the inside. Inside it says, uh, God does not beget and God is not begotten. It's an affront to Christians, right? Very, very interesting. I had the chance to be in there. I might have been one of very few non-Muslims that was in there. As an architect, when I was attending Beth Hillel, I got a chance to go in because it was under renovation. Crawled around on the scaffold up there. Oh, my goodness. Daniel, I've now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I've come to tell you for your highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. We're going to discover the dark side. Daniel got hauled up held up for 21 days until Michael, uh, sorry, Gabriel, thank you, honey, <laughs> I'm getting Alzheimer's. Yeah, sorry, Gabriel gets held up 21 days because uh, uh, he it is the prince of Persia, but obviously not Darius, because Darius then writes still this incredible, uh, you know, sort of a attestation to uh, God as king of the universe, because you got to, you got to trust Daniel and his stuff, because the whole lion's den situation. Um 
But there is a spiritual force, a spiritual power of Persia at play that holds Gabriel up for 21 days for coming. Michael has to help him in a system. Oh, and guess what? By the way, the next thing I got to do is go uh, and, and combat with the prince of Greece. Greece is not for another 200 years. He would have said, well, what the heck is that? I know Macedonia. I don't know Greece. But but that's the word of the Lord. Incredible, incredible. Vision clear, uh, clearly only referencing the vision that we saw in chapter 8. So understand the vision. Gabriel, the man that I saw before, you remember he was at the river Ulai, and uh, somebody called out to him, Gabriel, explain the vision to the man. So he starts to explain it, and now he's going to explain the rest of the vision. And don't forget, the request was, God, can you please come not for our sakes, but for your sakes and your reputation, come and vindicate your holy hill. And it does get vindicated. All right. All right. Here we are. 77s now. Echad, Shtaim, Shalosh. Arba, Chamesh, Shesh, Shiva, Shiva. So um, every word in Hebrew means something. So when you see the word Beit, which is the second letter of the alphabet, it means house. Beit Lechem. Um, Beit, house of Lechem, but Beit is also of the alphabet. We say B doesn't mean any. Well, B can be bumblebee, but we don't think of it in those terms. But Beit is house. And so so um, 77s is the way to interpret it, not weeks. Don't know how they get weeks. It's because it's the same word that means weeks, right? So, so you get uh, Shavuot, which means a week, but it's not. It's it's in the context of being the seven. It'd be like somebody interpreting uh, bait as house if it gets used in a context where it's intended to be the letter of the alphabet, right? So, if your Bible says seventy week, it really means seventy seven. Uh, one thing that NIV gets right here, interesting. Decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression. And then to send to atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So I thought we should take this look at this list, and, and Karen mentioned it. Um, so the significance of the 77 to 490 is interesting because we're going to discover when um, Peter asks, How often should I forgive? Christ says 70 times 70. It wasn't joking, it wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't anonymous. It was, that's what God does. That's that's how often, right? And we're going to discover what that is all about. And here it is. Um, he carried, this is out of Chronicles now, so it's another look at it. He carried into exile to Babylon, the remnant, who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him. So Daniel and Ezekiel, we know, are among them, and his successors in the king, until the kingdom of Persia came to power which was on the night that Belshazzar dies. Can you guys see how knowing this stuff like really helps you when you read the Bible? Oh my goodness, I know this stuff. I know that that, that was the night that there was the writing on the wall. That's when Persia and the Medes and the Persians came to power, right? The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All of the time of its desolation, it rested for 70 years until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So God said, listen, you guys missed because every seventh year, we know this from Exodus and from um, the law of the Sabbath. Yes. Six years you shall sow your land and gather its produce, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. And we just actually came to the 50th year, the year of Jubilee. And so what a lot of Jews did, and I have firsthand knowledge of it, they sold their land for that year. And then they had a deal where they would buy it back the next year so that they might not. That's not what God intended, right? That's not what God intended. But these guys went uh, 70 years of missing the Sabbath year. And it's very clear in Chronicles that God has hinged it to it. And the reason you're there for 70 years is because you missed 70 years of um, Sabbath rest over those years where you did not honor my commandment to you in Exodus. And so here we are. It's correlated in the word of God in Chronicles. It draws the comparison. And now we know why that judgment came. Very, very interesting. All right. And then Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up seven times. Jesus answers, I tell you not seven times, but 70 seven times 70 times seven times it's supposed to be 490 so again we got a little bit of a translation issue here but he's meaning the exact same context right not an arbitrary number it was based on what god himself honored all right 
77s are decreed for your people in the holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin. Let's, let's look at this list. Okay. So we have to finish transgression. Do you think transgression is done right now? Like we have all millennials who happen to believe that maybe that's already been fulfilled. But all I have to do is open the newspaper and see that transgression is not finished. People are sinning often, regularly. We have a whole month committed to sin. To one of the deadly sins and to sexual sin. Oh, my goodness. Put an end to sin. No, there's no end to sin. There's not transgression is not finished and sin is not ended. To atone for wickedness. Has that been done? Christ has done that, maybe. Christ has atoned. Huh? Right. But that's when it will happen. And today we can say with confidence that Christ has atoned for wickedness. That's that's true. Bring in everlasting righteousness. No. Guys, we would not be facing the conundrums we face on this earth if everlasting righteousness was here. It's going to come with the messianic reign, which you remember, Gabriel says, what I really want to tell you about is the time of the end when that big rock will come and fill the whole earth. It'll be a mountain and we will be under a messianic reign and it'll all be set to right. To seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Interesting. We have an incredible word here saying there will be a holy place again on the Temple Mount. There will be a, a, a temple there and it will be anointed. And we discover as we read in the Messianic grain that it's a thing. It's It, it gets talked about um, and uh, very, very fascinating. So these are still things that are in the future. All right. So we have 77 and 62, 7, 69, 7. And it would be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. But when we read about how they tried very long time to rebuild Jerusalem, but it wasn't going easy. You remember they had to have a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other? Probably the other way around. Sword and trowel. Unless I guess you're right or left-handed. My dad used to get his knuckles slapped whenever he tried to grab the pencil with his right hand or left hand until he got his right hand. I don't know. But anyway, they had a sword in one hand. That's kind of because they had to protect themselves. But a trowel is actually a pretty good sword, too. I remember one time I threw it into a planks that we were walking on, and it poked through the bottom that far, and it went right through the plank. And I'm thinking, okay, Dinah, that's uh, got to watch where I throw that thing. All right. The anointed one will be put to death and have nothing. Ruth, can you read your your version of 26 one more time for us? Yes. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So um, Karen was asking me a little bit about the end coming like a flood because there's no flood associated with it. And um, I like a flood. Yeah. So which is a diaspora. Uh, is actually that the 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 Jews get dispersed in that time. Now, we have sequential things going on here. Um, we're going to have the anointed one coming. Then he's going to die, and surprisingly very short after, right? And uh, he will be killed. Uh, Mashiach Nagid, the soon coming king, will be karat, which means executed but not for himself for whom does he get executed for all, of us. for all of us but the order the sequence is a critical thing and then the ruler will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary that happens with titus in the year 70 vespasian his dad becomes the new caesar and he says to his son titus finish the job son because under nero he was put with his dad into the Galilee, and they were conquering all the Galilean lands, right? This uh, this was the time of Christ. And then they were getting ready to deal with Jerusalem, and then um, Nero dies. So Vespasian goes back to Rome, and, and there's a little bit of very short Caesar reigns there, and eventually the last Caesar just ahead of Vespasian gets killed by his own soldiers, and now Vespasian is it, and... and, and uh, we end up having Titus destroy the temple. And then the way Vero pointed out, 
all that gold comes back and they build the Colosseum and the Titus Arch is there and you can go see it. You can see all of the, the temple gold, the menorah and the trumpets all coming in. You can Google that and you can see it in a heartbeat. Uh, I've been there. It's, it's, it's a little bit uh, discreet. You have to find it. So, so this creates an order of things to happen. And it's like in two verses, but it's incredibly profoundly clear what's going on. The people will come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and war will continue, continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. As war continued to the end, we we're going to have the war to end all wars. Oh, that didn't work. Well, that was the First World War then. Okay, then we had the Second World War. Well, hopefully that's enough. And gosh, it looks a lot like we might be having a third. All right. So um, Sir Robert Anderson looks at this. He discovers, you know what? Uh, the biblical prophetic year is 360, and the Babylonian year was 360 days, to which um, Gabriel was speaking to Daniel in the context of his understanding of a year, right? So 360 is the, so it says it will be 483 years, 7 times 62, 69 groups of sevens. 7 times 69 equals 483 years. Um, Anderson understood a prophetic year is 360 days based on ancient history and revelation. 11, 2, 13, 5, 11, 3, I'm not going to go there today. 12, 6, which indicate that 42 months, three and a half years are 1260 days. Keeps repeating it over and over again, divide it out. You get exactly the time frame, right? So we know a year to the Lord is 360 days. All right. Therefore, 483 years times 360 equals one. 173,880 days. Now, you have a lot of complexities because when we switch to the year of our Lord, I should actually put that on this chart, we miss a year because we go from 1 BC to 1 AD and where is zero, right? Like uh, the Chinese count you one when you're born out by three months. But 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 in our culture, like you, you need to go from zero to one in order to have year one, right? And so that gets overlooked, and I'm going to add that to this chart because that's an important little piece to know. And under well, to to my other chart. Sorry, it's not this one. It's it's the one that I've still got in the computer, right? Okay. And then you also have to do the leap year calculations because by the time we get the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, um, this uh, Robert Anderson, our our sleuth, has to add all that in and do the math, right? Okay. So we get that and we analyze it. Now we need a decree. So Artaxerxes starts his reign in 465 BC. The decree to rebuild Jerusalem was given on the first day of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. In our calendar system, the Julian, that date is March 14th, 445 BC, Nehemiah 2.1. Jesus started his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius. Tiberius started his reign in 14. So Jesus, and this is all absolute known history. So Jesus' ministry started in AD 29. And that means that we end up with the final Passover because he experiences four Passovers is in the year 32. And with lunar charts, we can calculate the exact dates of the ancient Passovers because that's as per the moon. And it's possible to calculate the exact day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as April 6th, the year 32. Now, the reason that most theologians have a problem with it is because Passover was on Thursday, not on Friday. But I can talk for two hours on the fact that Christ was in the tomb for three days and three nights, as in Jonah. He was killed Wednesday night on the day of preparation as the Passover lambs in preparation. We can see that over and over again. Judas went out to buy stuff. If it was Passover, he didn't go out to buy stuff on Passover evening because everything was closed and it was against the law to buy anything. But it says the disciples thought he went out to buy something. It was on the day of preparation. In fact, it says in the Bible, if you find the right translation, he was crucified on the day of preparation. Don't forget, it starts at sunset, sunset that day. So Thursday he was in the grave. Friday was in the grave. Saturday was grave. On sunset of Saturday, he was free to rise to be up on the first day of the week, Sunday, exactly as scriptures say. It is so perfect. But the reason theologians have trouble with it, because they can't wrap their head around a Thursday Passover and a Wednesday night crucifixion, but it is so accurate. And I can find you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture to prove it to you over and over again. So Christ was crucified Wednesday night. Thursday night was the Passover. Friday he was in the grave. All of those were high Sabbaths. Saturday, oh, is it that time already? Thanks, Paul, for all you do. Gosh, where does it go? <laughs> and for all, I love you guys. It is, it's 10. Oh my goodness. All right. 
Um, so here we go. There's Xerxes Long Germanus, there's his long hand. That's fascinating to me. Um, so in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king, never been sad before. And he says, um, if it pleases the king, and I found favor in your sight, send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried. Oh, and by the way, I need it in writing. So if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors, uh, the trans Euphrates, so that they'll provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. So I went to the governors of trans Euphrates and gave them the king's letters or decree. It is this um, letter of Artaxerxes Longimanus that issued the decree that starts the count. So then you take the count from his day. And um, from 445, there are 476 years on Julian calendar, not 477, because there's no year zero. Remember that old switch, right? So that equals 173,740 days, adjusting for the difference between March 14th and April 6th, adds 24 days. For leap years, over 476 years, adds 116 days. Total number of days, March 14th to 445 to April 6th is 173,880 days. And so according to his calendar, Daniel told us there would be 173,880 days between the decree and the arrival of Messiah the Prince. Now, I'm totally convinced that Sabbaths have never drifted because the Jews are way too panicky around their Sabbaths for them to have ever drifted. So you should be able to count uh, the years through the Sabbaths because that is indiscriminate of leap years. So you should be able to come up with it exactly, and they do. And so there you go. So the arrival of the prince. So Jesus, who would never let himself be crowned prince, um, suddenly arranges it on one fine day. He keeps sneaking out of the crowd. No, you're not going to crown me, prince. No, 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 I'm out of here. But then one day he says, go and find a donkey. Get it for me. And I'll go riding in. And he rides in. And this is the day. So all of the people that are there are singing Psalm 118, the Hallel. This is the day. That is the day. And there's nothing wrong with us singing that about our days right now. But it was a very specific day, which the Lord has made, and we will rejoice in it and gladden it. And the, um, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law say, tell those people to be quiet. And Jesus says, guys, if I tell them to be quiet, the stones are going to start to yell. Do you realize that? Because they recognize, the Pharisees and the Jews recognize that he was calling himself the Son of God, the Messiah, in the context of this song being sung as he rode into Jerusalem. So it is precisely to this day which is exactly as per our scripture. And oh my God, I'm so sorry. We're always so short of timing. Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter, you'll find the cult side there. There's a secret password. Uh, say the Lord needs it. That's fine. Then you get it. And uh, there we go. And they brought it and they put their cloak, the whole crowd, and they're all singing the Hallel. They're singing Psalm 118. Exactly. And that is the most incredible uh, Bible messianic part of the word of God, right? They should have recognized it, and Jesus holds them accountable. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. So let's take a quick look at that. Um, he, he approaches the city, and he weeps over it and says, if you, Jerusalem, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now what is hidden from your eyes. Jesus speaks spiritual blindness on the Jews until we get to this end period where they yearn for him, which is the middle of the tribulation where they're suddenly realizing, oh, our Messiah did not turn out. We got our, 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 our temple all right. But now he set up his own statue in the Holy of Holies, the abomination that causes desolation. They realize, oh, my goodness. And they yearn for Jesus. And that's the next three and a half years are, are dreadful. But then Jesus comes. Oh, my goodness. They'll dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. You'll not leave one stone another because you do not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And this is it. This is the day, the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, right? And this is what they're singing. The stone the builders reject has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done it marvelous in his eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. This is the very day. This is the day that the Lord has made. The Lord is good. He's made his light shine on us with bows in hand, join in the festival profession, up to the horns of the altar, to the horns of the altar. Oh, my goodness. You are my God. I will praise you. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for his good. His love endures forever. So that happens right there. The Messiah, Nagid, gets, uh, uh, Mashiach, Nagid, gets cut off, karat, not for himself, for us. And then we get the time of the Gentile. And then he starts talking about that seventh week. We're going to have lots of time in 10, 11, and 12 to look at that. So there we go.
Now you know the rest of the story. The end will come like a flood. War will continue to the end. And we're going to look at those uh, 77 in the next couple chapters. Sorry, guys, I've gone four minutes over this closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you're sovereign. We just thank you that your word is so impeccably accurate to the minute, to the hour, to the day. And so, Lord, we just rejoice in that. And it just uh, causes faith to rise in us. We recognize your word written outside of this time domain and with an incredible story of our salvation. You died. You died for us. And we're so grateful. Praise you, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we would live in the confidence of that hope. And Lord, as over the next weeks, we look at the end times, the times of tribulation, Lord, that you would help us understand and know your word in Jesus name. Amen. Well, bless you guys. A lot of stuff. <laughs> a little too much. Bless you all online. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a lot of math to do, and there'll be a few leap seconds in there as well, right? Thank you, everybody, for being online. <laughs>